Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Travel extensively throughout the national park system, and you'll quickly come to realize that the park's restaurants try to reflect the local culinary trends, or at least use local ingredients in crafting their menus. For instance, visit national parks in Alaska, and you can pretty much count on salmon among the dinner offerings. Travel through the parks in the Rocky Mountains, and elk, and sometimes bison, will appear on the menus. Explore parks in the Southwest, and you can almost predict that cacti will show up in some form. This is Kurt Repencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. You can be amazed at the menus chefs in the national park system roll out. Even more amazing is how they can feed hundreds of people at mealtime and largely maintain consistency with what they put in front of you. This week, we're going to explain how you can mimic some of these chefs in your own kitchen. Our guest is Linda Lee, author of The National Parks Cookbook. We'll be back in a minute with Linda to see if we can inspire you with some new home menus, from beverages and appetizers to entrees and desserts. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smokey's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Welcome to The Traveler, Linda. It's great to have you with us. Hi, Kurt. Thank you for having me. So... Why a National Park Cookbook? What inspired you from mealtime in the parks to produce this book? Well, I have always been a longtime fan of the national parks. Road trips have always been my preferred way to travel and explore the country. Um, And there's just something about the national parks, like the grandeur of them, the history, how these are such um, pristine, you know, untouched wildernesses and a lot of the different parts that you go to. Um, I've just always been intrigued by them. And I've been intrigued, you know, especially as I started writing the book and diving into the history. I'm intrigued by how long they've been around, how they were formed um, and the traditions that they've kept up. Yeah, no, it's definitely an interesting chapter of the national parks. But but let's talk about dining in the national parks. I mean, the challenge for chefs has to be incredible when you consider the number of diners that pass through their dining rooms, whether for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. And then there's all those other um, intangibles that they don't always have full control over in terms of their wait staff or serving or whether there's power to the stove or propane or gas to the stove. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, the challenges of cooking in the park are pretty amazing. You know, like I remember when I was interviewing um, or even reading about some of the restaurants that I have recipes for in the book, um, what it took to just get a meal on the table. And Mm -hmm. it's incredible, especially when you're thinking about these far flung places like national parks in Alaska, where to them, local food is anything that's in the state, right? Not like what we think like um, of how local food has to be within a hundred miles. They're like, oh, like if it's like within three or 500 miles, it's good. <laughs> right, right. You know, and just the weather that affects them and just how to get the food down to the actual restaurant or lodge um, takes quite a bit. Like if you were to go down to the Grand Canyon and to the Phantom Ranch, they have to haul all of their groceries in by pack mules. 
Um, so there's quite a lot that goes into just like what you think is an ordinary bowl of stew. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure. I'm sure. But, you know, have you ever had a meal that was off in the national park system? That was off? That was off. Just not quite what you expected. It didn't taste right. Um, I mean, like I, like I said, you know, yeah, the, I, the logistics that the chefs and their staff have to overcome are incredible. And when, when you're at a place, whether it's, uh, say the Awani in Yosemite or the Old Faithful Inn in Yellowstone or, or Skyland up in Shenandoah. I mean, you're dealing with hundreds of people and boy, the, the pressure has to be enormous. Yeah. I mean, like any restaurant, I think you're bound to have an off meal every now and then. When you're in the national parks, I probably give them, you know, I I give them a little bit more um, leeway <laughs> with the okay. food, you know, just because I do understand, especially depending on where I am, if I'm in the middle of nowhere, my expectations are lowered a bit mm -hmm. um, to account for that. Because for me, dining in a national park is not just about the food, but it's also about the setting. Sure. You know, so my expectation of like a restaurant in a city is very high, but in the national park, I'm honestly just happy to be there with a view. And if I can get like a pretty decent meal, then I'm happy. Interesting. Interesting. So your bar wavers a little bit depending on where you're located. It is, you know, but what's surprising is that a lot of these national parks have these great chefs um, and uh, kitchen teams that produce really delicious hot meals mm -hmm. you know, with what they have. And yeah. so when I come across that, then it's always a pleasant surprise. <laughs> <laughs> now, I've noticed in recent years, um, and we're just talking the last two or three years, that buffets at times have replaced menus that, that offer you a range of entrees. So you, you've got the buffet and what's on the buffet is what you have to eat or what you have to choose from. Was that just a product of uh, the COVID pandemic and, and how it reduced the ranks in the kitchens and so they could only do so much? Or, or is this something we can expect more of? That's a good question. I think it's probably both. You know, when I wrote the National Parks Cookbook, it was in um, 2021. And, you know, parks were not operating at their full capacity at that mm -hmm. time. And so the menus were much more limited and there were definite substitutions and new ways of doing things in these restaurants. You know, they became, you know, everything became contactless and uh, takeout. And so I think the way that the kitchens adapted to all the new restrictions was by really emphasizing portable food, takeout food that could still taste good, you know, even after you've left the restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, something that was quick and easy where people didn't have to be in like a crowded room together. And I think that part will continue because that also speaks to the way people tend to travel when they're in the parks, right? Like they're always on the go. They want to be on their next hike. They want to be on a picnic and maybe they don't want to be sitting around in a restaurant for a couple of hours. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think that we will see more takeout style options. But I also think that this is also, uh, like everywhere else, I like guess, staffing issue that they try to resolve. Well, absolutely. And and with any restaurant, staffing is key. Over the years, um, I, I'm in Utah, in Park City, Utah. The ski industry is here. I've, I've written for ski magazines and some travel magazines. And I've done food writing, although I'm not a food writer by any stretch of the imagination. But one thing that really struck me at the Deer Valley Resort, and it's been a while since I've covered the ski industry closely, but um, the last time I was there um, for a menu tasting, their kitchen staff, their, their chefs, their sous chefs, et cetera, had been a team that had been together for, I don't know, 10 years, 15 years. That's kind of an anomaly in, in the the restaurant business isn't i mean do you see in the national parks where you've got that sort of longevity in one park i would assume that that's rare based on some discussions that i've had with various chefs i mm -hmm. think turnover um well turnover in the restaurant business as a whole is pretty high but in national parks i think it's higher just because for a lot of people 
being in a national park with limited resources is probably not what they aspire to as a chef. You know, it's sort of, it's like one of those stages in life where you think it would be a wonderful experience and it is, but then you're ready to move on from that. Hmm. So, um, so I, you know, it was rare for me to find a chef that had like a longstanding history at the park. Like mm-hmm. most executive chefs start to turn over, you know, within five to 10 years, if they even last that long. Mm-hmm. Um, and the kitchen staff have even um, less, <laughs> they're there for much less time. Sure, sure. You get a lot of seasonal employees moving through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is Kurt Rappencheck. We're talking today with Linda Lee, the author of a new cookbook that you'll want to have in your home kitchen library, the National Parks Cookbook. We're going to take a short break and then really get into the book with Linda. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference too at friendsofacadia.org. With Interior Federal Credit Union, you can rest assured your funds are safe. Credit unions are insured by the National Credit Union Administration, the NCUA, which means that your accounts have insurance up to $250,000. Our members haven't lost a penny of insured funds. Stay protected and join today at interiorfcu.org. So Linda, let's let's dive into your book. Before we get into the individual items, how did you just go about deciding which menu items to feature? I mean, there are hundreds of national parks. <laughs> well, this this was an interesting part because um, as we all know, most national parks don't have their own restaurants or lodges. So for me, I started with what what restaurants there were you know, that was uh, famous for its food. And so I was already very limited by that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I picked like a lot of like the greatest hits, you know, so like Yellowstone, Yosemite. Um, these are places that are just known for their outstanding lodges. They're known for these iconic dishes. And so I started with those. For a lot of the national parks that didn't have their own lodges, I actually started with the flora and fauna. And so um, there's like certain memories that I have of visiting these parks, you know, the way the flowers smelled, um, the berries that you can forage while you're on a trail. And I used those elements as inspiration for my own original recipes that could hopefully bring people back to their experience in the parks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And some of these recipes are actually signature dishes that they've been around for decades and are still being served in the parks pretty close to um, the original and, th- and that's what they're known for like Acadia's popovers. Sure. Yeah. I remember those when I was a young kid. Are you a cook who writes or are you a writer who cooks? I am definitely a cook who writes. I was going to say, it sounds like, <laughs> it. which is good, which is good. Anybody can write, but not anybody can cook. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, it definitely helps, you know, before I ever wrote my first cookbook, my recipes, the way they were written was very much written in a home style meant for myself, meant for my friends, you know, like, oh, a, a little bit of oil, uh, throw in a little bit of onion. <laughs> so transitioning to cookbook writing was different. You know, you had to be so exact and you had to give the instructions in a way that the average person at home can follow easily. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that's always a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. Who was your um, test case? <laughs> <laughs> my husband, <laughs> my dear husband, who has tasted every single thing that I made, including the mess ups. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, in terms of 
conveying the instructions in in a way that the the average um, home cook can can work with. For that, I do have an editor, a copy editor that I work with. Um, but now I've published like five or six books, and I. I've got it down as to like the process of how to write a certain recipe. Uh, um, but I used to have like a lot of like dozens of friends who would test recipes for me and they would send me notes. Like, I, I don't really get what you're trying to say here. You're saying like before <laughs> or after, you know, it gets up to heat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, through a lot of practice. <laughs> now, now I am a writer who cooks. And um, one thing I, I liked about this book is right off the bat, you provide a section on kitchen essentials and know-hows. I mean, not only do you talk about the types of saucepans and the sizes of saucepans, but you get down into to the stuff like um, types of oil to use and, and don't use salted butter. Or no, you do use salted butter. I do use salted butter. Yeah. Why is that? We're all taught not to use salted butter. <laughs> um, well, I tend to only keep one type of butter around in the house, and I do mostly savory cooking. So for me, salted butter is just, it just tastes better, honestly, than unsalted butter. So if I'm buttering like a piece of toast, um, mm. I like salted butter. Also, when you think about it, salted butter, there's actually very little salt in it, you know, compared to what most people think. I think that in like a, what I found is like the average stick of supermarket butter that you buy, there's only about a quarter teaspoon of salt, which is not that much when you yeah. consider you're only using a tablespoon or two each time. Yeah. So any difference in taste is very negligible. It, it's interesting. You you even talk about eggs. You always use large eggs, and you always try and use uh, pasture raised eggs as opposed to free range or cage free. Why is that? Uh, well, cage free and free range. Well, let's the egg industry. Like these types of labels are not regulated. Um, so when you're buying a carton of eggs that you think are premium and they're claiming to be cage free or free range. People really, who knows what that really means, right? The chickens could still be in their, you know, caged up in their coops with like a tiny little door to the outside. And they're like, oh, but they're, um, you know, they have free range of like a whole pasture, but they might <laughs> never actually go outside. <laughs> and so pasture raised has come to be um, an accepted term um, as far as agriculture is concerned, where the chickens are raised out on a pasture, you know. Mm -hmm roaming freely um, and they may or may not go back into like a coop to sleep <laughs> yeah. they're kind of out there funding for themselves okay okay well you know I, I just got the book the other week so i haven't had a chance to dive into um actually cooking the recipes but i have gone through and marked quite a few and uh, have encouraged my wife to to go through it and, and tell me what she wants me to cook her um <laughs> so did you travel to each one of these parks represented in your book I travel to most of them, the ones that uh, on the West. Um, and so you'll find that a lot of the recipes um, I talk about uh, in my head notes, I talk about, um, you know, I when I experienced the meal in the dining room and I, if I wasn't able to get the actual recipe from the chef, then I recreated it based on what I tasted. You mean the chefs wouldn't share with you? Yeah, you know, like some of these, some of these chefs were just very secretive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Some uh, years, some some years ago, ago um, I, I started a, a feature on the Traveler to um, share recipes from chefs, and um, the ones I reached out to were, were more than willing to help, and they even dumbed down the recipe instead of cooking for five hundred people. You know, they would make a recipe for you know, four <laughs> or six. Yeah. Um, I wish it was something we could keep up because, you know, as, as you indicated earlier, the, the food that you consume in the national park is part of that national park experience. How were you able to obtain some of the ingredients that you used? I mean, we've got lingonberries in some recipes, huckleberries, cactus, conch, razor clams. It's not something you go down to your local grocery store and find some of those things. No, I would say that this was a rather expensive cookbook to produce <laughs> <laughs> because what I could not find, I mean, I, I live in Bend, Oregon, which is, you know, it's known as a foodie town sort of, but honestly, it's kind of like a food desert mm. um, because we don't have the selection of like, uh, you know, a metropolitan city. 
And so for a lot of these recipes, um, if I couldn't order it through my local grocery store, like specific types of seafood that I needed, then I ordered online, you know, so for things like bison short ribs, which you can't really find here, I ordered it direct from uh, Montana or Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Then for um, lingonberries and some of these other like more uh, unusual berries, I actually ordered them frozen from uh, Northwest suppliers. So you can find pretty much almost anything online. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, there was a, a couple of things you mentioned. You can usually find this in your local grocery store. And I said, nope, not, not in Park City, which is hard <laughs> to believe. I mean, you know, prickly pear is kind of tough to find. It is. And it's very seasonal. You know, like prickly pear, I actually had to stock my local Latin grocer um, for a few weeks. Like, is it in season yet? Did you guys get it back yet? <laughs> uh-huh. So, uh-huh. yes, yeah, so I was able to get that. <laughs> Remarkable. And your, your, your editor, the publisher, didn't didn't cover the cost for some of that stuff? Uh, no, with a lot of, I mean, this is just my experience, but from what I understand from talking with other cookbook authors, um, everybody funds their own ingredients. You know, that just comes out of wow. uh, what you make from the yeah. book. Yeah. Bummer. <laughs> All right. Well, let's let's work through the the book as if we were sitting down at, at dinner and using time travel to go to all these wonderful parks that you uh, you write about. And so we'll start with with drinks. And I'm going to jump around uh, the the country a little bit because um, I don't think we have time to go through each and every one that I picked out. Although I'd love to. Huckleberry Margarita from Grand Teton National Park. <laughs> yes. That one, I actually drank um, and totally loved. Uh, I was at Jackson Lake and there's a little bar there Mm -hmm. um, where I ordered uh, a couple of huckleberry margaritas, like after a long drive and like a couple of hikes with my family. Um, And for me, first of all, I love huckleberries. I have heard that you can go picking huckleberries in like different places, but nobody will reveal their little secret spots to me. <laughs> well, you gotta watch out for the grizzly bears too. Yeah, that too. Um, so I, I'm a big fan of huckleberries. So anything that's made with huckleberries, I'm all over it. You know, like ice cream pie and margaritas, especially that's my favorite type of cocktail. So huckleberry margarita is just this great blend of sweetness mm-hmm. um, mixed with like, you know, the zest that you get from a margarita. And I really liked having like these little tiny drops of fresh or frozen huckleberries inside it. Yeah. It feels like you're drinking like a fruit drink <laughs> in a way. So you got that at the Jackson Lake Lodge? I did, yes. Yeah, well, we're going there in June, so we'll have to stop by and, and sample it, um, see how it goes. Another one that really caught my attention, um, the Butterscotch Martini from Bryce Canyon National Park. <laughs> yeah, so that is a an invented recipe. <laughs> I really, so one of the things that I always remember from uh, Bryce is the smell of the trees, you know, like you peel back the bark and I always tell my kids like, Hey, take a sniff because it smells like fresh baked cookies or caramel or butterscotch kind of depends on like the specific tree that you choose. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what I always remember is like that smell. Um, And so I created the butterscotch martini, you know, kind of as my way of paying tribute to the smell of Bryce Canyon, because that's what it reminds me of. You know, this is just like a sweet dessert drink. Um, I recommend it after dinner and it really tastes just like a like a liquid butterscotch pie, I guess. (laughs) I I don't think you have too many of them looking at the recipe. I mean, you call for two ounces of butterscotch schnapps two ounces of vanilla vodka and two ounces of Irish cream liqueur. Yeah. And that's, um, (laughs) that's just for the martini. And you've also got a cup of heavy cold cream, um, cold, heavy cream, powdered sugar and Irish cream cream liqueur again for the whipped cream uh, that goes on top. Yeah. This is a, it's a very strong drink. FYI. (laughs) (laughs) Don't let the sweetness fool you. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Now a surprising, um, entry in here, um, I think most people would agree, prickly pear agua fresca from Indiana Dunes National Park. Mm-hmm. No, I, I don't, I'm not sure many people would associate prickly pear with Indiana Dunes. I don't know. Yeah, right. And I actually did not know that they existed up there either, but they are found all over the park, like all over the sand dunes. 
Hmm. Um, and I found that there's like different varieties of prickly pear cacti all over the country, right? Mm -hmm. uh, for that recipe, you can actually use any type of prickly pear because the fruits come in different colors. There can be like golden ones, pink ones, dark purple ones. They all work. They all have this very lovely, like tart, sweet flavor. A lot of people use prickly pear in lemonade, but mm -hmm. I think that like the flavor of prickly pear is so unique that I like them just in an agua fresca so that I could really taste the whole fruit without, you know, that lemony twist to it. Yeah. So this is a very refreshing drink that you can serve like over ice or you can have it blended. So. Do you have to wait until the prickly pear bears fruit? You do. Yes. And wait for them to be ripe. And so okay. this is a very seasonal drink. Yeah. And for anyone who wants to make their own prickly pear, Agua Fresca, when you go to Indiana Dunes National Park, do not pick the prickly pear from the park. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, appetizers, I'm not sure where to start. I mean, you've got so many wonderful things here, but I think we're going to st uh, start with um, cactus. You've got the, the cactus crisps with cilantro lime crema from Carlsbad Caverns. That sounds phenomenal. That is, you know, I, I get a lot of um, Nepalese, you know, that's the prickly, the the cactus paddles in my local grocery store. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always trying to find unique ways of using them. Mm -hmm. So this is just like a fun appetizer where um, if you don't have cactus paddles, by the way, you can actually use the ones that come in the jar that are already pre-sliced. Mm -hmm. um, and That's a little bit easier to find. But cactus... The taste of it is kind of a, hmm, it's kind of hard to describe. It's one of those foods that takes on the flavor of whatever else it's cooked with in a way, but it also has its own distinctive flavor that I can't quite place. It's like kind of like earthy yet tangy. It's hard to describe, uh, which is why the cilantro lime crema really brings that out even more. Hmm. I feel. <laughs> and, and are we talking prickly pear paddles or? Yes. Yes. Okay. They make the best ones. Let's go down to um, Florida and Biscayne National Park where you had conch fritters with key lime aioli. Oh, yes. That's... Oh, wait a minute. Before, before we go there, before we go there, let's back up to the cactus crisps. Is this something... Um, um, I don't think Carlsbad has a lodge, does it? It does not. So how did you strike on this... Uh, recipe because the whole landscape is filled with cactus um, so like a lot of the trails that lead into the caverns mm -hmm. um, are lined with cactus okay okay now we can fly off to florida and your conch fritters with uh, the key lime aioli which sounds just just decadent yes you know like conch shell um a lot of times like people make them as steaks and it can be kind of chewy Right. Uh, you know, in my experience, but when you chop them up into a fritter, it actually, the chewiness works in its favor because it gives it um, these little balls, like deep fried balls, a nice um, bite to them, you know, and with this recipe, like obviously conch shell is not available everywhere and you can use um, chopped up shrimp or chopped up fish, you know, or chopped up clams or like a mix of all different types of seafood to get the same results. Hmm. You, you say the conch is kind of chewy. Is it kind of like a calamari chewy? Yes. Yes. Okay. You know, and you can like, you can pound it uh, with a mallet, you know, there's different ways of trying to tenderize it with acid. Um, but it's, it's, it's like calamari basically yeah. so for people who aren't into that texture, they will still like the conch fritters because they are not too chewy. It just has like, it just, I don't know how to explain it. It's just like a really delicious, like, hearty bite. I guess. I mean, I, I'm looking at the recipe here and, and I apologize to the listeners. We just don't have time to go through all the ingredients for the various um, items we're talking about, but the, the conch fritters, you're talking about using half of a scotch bonnet pepper. Oh yeah. That'll, that'll <laughs> light up your life. <laughs> <laughs> just half, but Hey, you know, some, maybe some people want to use the whole one. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Depends on their tolerance for sure. Yeah, my wife doesn't have that much tolerance, and I'm always cutting back, cutting back, cutting back. I, I'm, <laughs> yeah, that that would really be a 
a kick in the mouth, scotch. The scotch, scotch bonnet, bonnet is like a local, um, it's a local favorite, and that's why I put it in there. <laughs> All right, good deal. Before we leave the appetizer tray, um, lingonberry brie, and I don't know if I pronounce this right, on cruet, cruet? On cruet? In Denali National Park. Mm -hmm. What's that all about? It looks wonderful. So uh, Brie en Cru is basically cheese, Brie cheese, wrapped in um, pastry dough and then baked. And so when it comes out of the oven, you get like the nice like puffy pastry on the outside. And when you dig like slice into it with a knife, you get this like ooey gooey melted cheese that is amazing with crackers or toasted bread. Um, it's a great it's like a crowd pleaser for an appetizer. Yeah, I bet. Uh, what I did in this recipe was I added uh, lingonberries on top so that the lingonberries also kind of oozed in there and blended with the cheese. So you get um, a bit of like the sweet and tartness of the lingonberries with the nice savory cheese. So it just adds like a little bit extra with some nice warm herbs. So for me, this is a great holiday offering for like the Thanksgiving table or Christmas table just because of like the nice smells and the textures mm -hmm. um, and the color, especially it's a very pretty dish to serve. Yeah, no, it looks gorgeous. And before we go on, I, I have to give uh, kudos to your husband, Will Taylor, who provided the photography for your cookbook. And um, the, the publisher obviously was um, paying attention because it's a hardcover cookbook. It's about eight by eight inches square. And you open it up to a recipe and the page stays open. It's not like you're fighting the page and it keeps turning over. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> beautiful work. Beautiful work. We're talking today with uh, Linda Lee, the author of a new cookbook, the National Parks Cookbook. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back with the main course. Whether it be strategy business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Patero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with the breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at Yosemite.org. Okay, we're back with Linda talking about her new cookbook, the National Parks Cookbook, which um, I know I'm going to get a lot of use out of. Entrees, I don't know where to begin, um, Linda, because uh, I just went right through the book and um, tried to pick out everything that sounded good. And so I've got a, a page and a half of uh, entrees that I've got to try and cook uh, over the months ahead of us. Bourbon elk chili. And uh, let me see. I, I forget where that recipe was from. Do you do you remember before I can find it? Bourbon elk chili, I believe, is Colorado, the Rockies. Right, right. Rocky Mountain National Park. Tell me about it. <laughs> so Rocky Mountain National Park does not have its own lodge, but it is known for having the largest elk population. And for me, like I know it's kind of, in a way, it sounds kind of weird because we're talking about like, elk population and people go to the Rockies to view herds of elk. And here I'm talking about cooking <laughs> and eating elk. Um, but, you know, I think you can still appreciate elk and also enjoy them. Um, so for me, this is just like a, it's just like a feel good one pot meal that you make on a cold day. The elk is tends to be like um, somewhat like a leaner meat. 
um, yes. and, beef. and so uh, and for me especially in this type of dish it doesn't have any kind of gamey flavor that you might associate with elk mm -hmm. um, you just really taste like this great savoriness from like all of the different spices and chilies um, used in the dish so yeah this is one that I actually go to come back to like over and over again, because I also experiment with different types of meat in it. You know, you can also use turkey if you don't have elk or you, of course beef or different cuts of beef or pork. But if you try it with elk, it's actually, uh, it makes like a nice filling meal without feeling too heavy in your stomach. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was going to ask you if you could use a different protein because uh, not everybody likes the, the flavor of elk, even, even if it's, you know, kind of changed a little bit in the chili, but you can't go down to your local grocery store across the country and find elk on the in the butcher shop. Right. Let's, um, let's go to Acadia. Um, I think that was the first national park I ever visited. I was a young boy, um, maybe six or seven years old. We drove up from New Jersey for a family vacation. Um, I returned in, in 2005 with my wife and we went to, um, Southwest Harbor. Um, I think it's Beals Lobster Pound and the lobstermen would just come in off the ocean and they would park right there at the bottom of the lobster pound and unload their lobsters and you can go into the pound and point the lobster that you want and they would boil it up and bring it out to you and you can't get much fresher than that you came up with a lobster stew from acadia yes i did <laughs> so acadia is one of those places where um the jordan pond house where i could not get any official recipes from them hmm. Um, and so I created my own copycat recipes that I feel are pretty close to the original, if mm -hmm. not, maybe even better. <laughs> <laughs> and mostly because I've seen their cookbook. And so I know what ingredients went into their um, signature recipes. Uh -huh. um, so with the lobster bisque, I add like my own little extra touch was just sherry, which is always delicious in a seafood stew. It just adds like a little bit depth, more depth of flavor. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because it's like, it's a lobster stew, but it's really just lobster in a broth, right? The stew, their style of stew is very um, thin. It really lets the lobster shine. Mm. You know, it's very simple. It's really just cream. And so for me, you know, besides having high quality lobster for this dish, the broth also has to stand out because that's really just the the other ingredient in this meal. Um, so for me, like having like a high quality cream and then like a dash of sherry in it really brings it up a notch. Very interesting. Very interesting. It looks wonderful. Let's go to Glacier National Park. Trout with wild rice and figs. Ah, so... Glacier was very kind enough to actually send me real recipes from their lodge. Um, the trout with wild rice and figs is one of them. So this came direct from their kitchen team. Do you remember which lodge? Was it was it Many Glacier or was it um, Lake McDonald Lodge? Um, the uh, Glacier Park Lodge, the historic lodge. Okay, uh, over in East Glacier. Mm -hmm. So it was like built by the railroad company, sure, um, sure. Yeah. you know, for all the tourists and all that. So their menu changes uh, seasonally as well, but this is one of their more popular ones that have been around. Um, so this, you know, uses trout, which is uh, easily sourced up in the glacier area. And, you know, because it uses figs, it's not something that you can make all the time. I would say it's just like something that you make in season. And if you can get fresh figs, I think that's the way to go. Um, I've also tried it with dried figs, you know, kind of rehydrated, but I think fresh figs would be even better. Mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. I'm going to go to New River National Park and Preserve for a couple of reasons. I was actually a raft guide on the New River back in my college days before it was part of the National Park System. And because you're calling for cast iron cornbread, and um, in the past year or so, I've really taken to cast iron cookery. And so you came up with West Virginia soup beans and cast iron cornbread. <laughs> Sounds like a nice uh, pairing. Yeah, this is like a great hearty meal. So uh, New River Gorge National Park is another one that does not have a lodge, but this is just kind of pays tribute to the area's history. So they have, um, you know, the Southern Appalachians have a long history of mining, and this is one of the um, types of like peasant food that was very popular back in the day, but it's still enjoyed today by the locals um, because it's hearty. 
uh, it can last many days if you let it. Um, it's easy to make. And it's just like, you know, totally warms your belly. Yeah, and I'm like, like, personally, like if you've ever looked at any of my other cookbooks, I'm a fan of these like peasant types of food. Like hmm. I love, <laughs> you know, like it's weird because I, I love to cook, but I don't like often for me, I don't like to eat like fancy food all the time. I just love these really simple home cooked meals that, you know, feel like your grandma made them. Yeah, no, for sure. And it kind of simmers all day long. Yeah, my favorite. Like I can just simmer a pot all day and eat that for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that type of cooking brings back a lot of memories for me from my childhood because uh, my mother was an excellent cook. Um, she was German, and every Sunday there'd be a big meal, and she'd probably start at around noon, and we wouldn't eat till five or six, and it would just fill the house with scents and, and aromas and memories. And, you know, I'm wondering with these recipes, it'd be curious to to hear from people who have bought your book and, and worked on some of these recipes, if when they made it, you know, it immediately brought them back to the, the park where the, the meal came from, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be interesting to know about. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's jump back to Alaska, um, Lake Clark National Park and Preserve, where you came up with razor clam chowder. And I'm guessing this would probably work for Olympic National Park because they have razor clams there as well. Yes. And so the razor clam chowder is not my own original recipe. That was contributed by um, one of the lodges. Uh, and this is where they gave me this recipe because razor clams are abundant um, in Lake Clark. And so this came from... Um, let me see. Let me the Silver Salmon Creek Lodge. Silver Salmon Creek Lodge. So this is one of their most popular recipes that they serve to their guests. And it's, you know, it's just sort of one of those things where like they can take you on like all these world-class fishing expeditions um, or you can like stay on the beach and dig for clams. And if you are on the beach digging for clams, they will actually cook it for you. Wow. Wow. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, it, it's it's a razor clam Um recipe would it work with uh cherry stone clams for instance any other type of clam i think it would work with any clam yes you know because every clam has like a slightly different um flavor right like there's just something about each one and i like everyone that i've talked to they have their own favorite clam so if you use your favorite clam in this recipe you can actually really make it your own yeah no i'm sure you could Creekside Clam Chowder, Olympic National Park. I think that's the one I wanted to, to go to next, not not specifically because it also has clams in it, but um, because I believe they serve it in a bread bowl, don't they? They do. Oh, and I've had it, and it's delicious. Yeah, I think I had it at Kalaylock when I was there. Mm -hmm. So do you um, – I'm, I'm turning the pages rapidly to try and get to the recipe – I want to see if you also gave the um, ingredients in the, the cooking for the bread bowl. It doesn't look like you did. I did not. <laughs> oh, come on. You're going to force us? <laughs> yeah, I kept it simple for this one where you can buy your own bread bowl. <laughs> yeah, well, if you're lucky enough to find them in your backyard, yeah. That is true. Um, so if you can get to like a great bakery uh, where you can like cut out your own bread bowl. Um, I actually find, sometimes I find at the grocery store like bread bowls that are already made. Mm -hmm. um, so I recommend sourdough bread bowls. That's all, always my favorite, uh, just for me, because I've always visited like San Francisco Bay area. And I always remember like sourdough bread bowls from there. Mm -hmm. Um, but you could, you know, if you can find like rosemary bread bowls or garlic bread bowls, I think all of that would work really well with this recipe. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, there were a bunch of recipes that I classified under miscellaneous, such as the popovers from Acadia National Park. It's not a a dinner. It's not an appetizer. It's a kind of a snack. A snack. Um, Navajo fry bread, Mesa Verde National Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Navajo fry bread is something that you find almost everywhere in the Four Corners region. I've had um, lots of different ones just off of the roadside from all these different stands. So I created my own fry bread that I think is accessible to a home cook. And for me, fry bread, fry bread is kind of like, it's, it's, can it's a canvas that you can use for so many other things, you know? So the fry bread that I've always had in the four corners, they would um, sprinkle it with powdered sugar or they add like honey to it. It's always like a sweet fry bread. Um, in Zion Lodge, they use it as a base for their tacos, which is basically an open-faced taco 
Uh, so you have like fry bread topped with chili and then with all of your various toppings like lettuce and tomatoes and onions, black beans or pinto beans, depending on what you like. So you can really, you can really experiment with how you like to use fry bread, but it's something that's great to just keep around. Mm-hmm. You no, know, quick and easy. Yellowstone National Park, anybody who has stayed at the Roosevelt Lodge, I'm guessing probably has the Roosevelt baked beans in their past. Yes, those are my absolute favorite. So Yellowstone, I got all of the recipes from their former executive chef, Michael Dean, who is very generous and gave me many of their um, customer favorites. And I specifically requested Roosevelt baked beans because I had that at the Roosevelt Lodge and I wish that they had given me an entire bowl. <laughs> like, no. I think my actual meal was like tamales and they served it with the side of these baked beans. But yeah. Yeah. Wow, these are amazing because they use so many different types of beans in it. And each one has like a slightly different texture. Um, so you're not just eating like, you know, a thing full of beans. You have like different mix of beans. You also have like the protein in there and then just the sauce that the beans simmer in. Mm-hmm. I could put that on so many other things. Like you can use these baked beans as a little side dish or as a dip um, put it over rice if you want. There's a lot of ways to use it. Yeah, sounds like it. We're going to get a little unusual. Um, Joshua Tree National Park, shroom jerky. <laughs> y- you, you came up with this yourself, right? I did. <laughs> Tell us about it. <laughs> Those are big portabellas I'm hoping you're using. They are, yeah. So this is just like a fun take on um, J Trees, what I call the National Park. Is you know it's known for uh, its sort of free spirited vibe. Shrimp jerky is a fun little snack that you can make and take with you into the park. But it's um, big portobello caps sliced and then baked in the oven, and so you make this sort of jerky style treat. That's also savory because you marinate it and in this like soy sauce um, blend that I have. Mm -hmm. And I would say, because my kids ate it, which is incredible (laughs) because they don't eat many things, but they totally loved it. Um, You know, like you're not going to fool anybody into thinking that it's like, you know, a beef jerky. It, it really does have its own unique texture and taste. And it's, um, it's really, it's kind of addicting, honestly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> does it, does it keep well? It does. Yes. You know, I mean, you can, um, I mean, it definitely keeps like just on your counter for a few days. I I don't think I've ever had it on the counter for longer than three or four days. Um, yeah. but you can also seal it in a bag and refrigerate. Yeah, no, we, um, we take paddle trips and, uh, the last time we were out on Yellowstone Lake for five days and, um, I think my wife would love this um, to have to snack on um, during the day. Yeah, and it feels healthy. <laughs> it's a healthy <laughs> snack. <laughs> Food is good for you. Uh, <laughs> before we leave the miscellaneous, I um, have to go to Saguaro National Park and Saguaro Fruit Salsa. Yeah. Um, so Saguaro Fruit is, um, it's, it's really, you know, it's kind of, If you get it when it's very ripe, it almost kind of falls apart on you, right? So um, like, just like the prickly pear fruit, it also has this similar sweet tart flavor. I really like using it in a fruit salad. Um, So for me, I vary the types of fruit that I use in the salad. You know, in this recipe, I use watermelon and mango with it, Mm -hmm. but it would work well with... Um, any other kind of fruit that you have, like peaches, nectarines, plums, um, you know, you just get this like, it's not as sweet as say a mango, but you just get this like really refreshing flavor out of it. But where do you find saguaro fruit? I, I don't think they grow it in downtown Bend. <laughs> they do not. This is something that if you're in the area, you would find it at the local markets. Or if you're lucky enough to grow like have a saguaro cactus in your yard. You can also harvest the fruit from there. Sure. (laughs) You know, but I think like a farmer's market um, in Southern Arizona and like, you know, surrounding the national park is your best bet for finding the fruit. Right. 
Right. So if you're if you're going on a vacation down to the southwest and uh, are fortunate enough to be staying in a place with a kitchen, you might want to pack this recipe with you and then uh, whip it up uh, for for at the end of your hike to enjoy. Or oh, I think you, you recommend it go, goes well over chicken or fish or whatever. Yeah. Or you can also just eat the fruit on its own if you don't have a kitchen. If, if you don't have a kitchen, you know, there's just like this. You know, for me, it has like this faint aroma of strawberries, you know, um, so it's really good to just eat out of hand. Okay. Okay. We're looking at the dessert menu. Not sure where to start exactly. There's quite a few berry dishes you have here. Let's go to Yosemite for the boysenberry pie. How's that look? I remember having boysenberry park on my first trip to the Awani. Oh gosh, this is almost 20 years ago for me, but it's been around for even longer. It's been around for 60 years. Um, so, you know, people might even remember their parents ordering it, you know, back in the day when they were visiting the park, but this is a longstanding recipe. It's changed very little from the original. The recipe was given to me by the park themselves. And so this is, this is a proven recipe that they serve to all of their guests. (laughs) Never had a complaint. I don't think so. It's still there. Interesting. Interesting. Okay. Um, you know, I'm in Utah, so I have to go to my backyard, Capitol Reef National Park, and mixed berry mini pies. I mean, that seems like a no-brainer because of the orchards they have there at Fruta. Yes, and I had a version of their mixed berry pies when I visited um, a couple summers ago, and that's where I came up with the idea for this recipe is because I loved it so much. It's so unique. I mean, like, Pies in national parks kind of go hand in hand for me because I usually find a great pie anywhere I go. But I loved being in the middle of Capitol Reef visiting the old homesteads there. They had turned one of the original homesteads into a um, small bakery and a gift shop. Mm -hmm. And I was very surprised to find these freshly baked pies in the gift shop. Like they're made locally um, by a bakery that's right outside of town. Uh, but it's it's very simple, right? It's just um, mixed berries, <laughs> you know. But they serve them. That. But they serve them these individual little um, tart crusts. So you, it's like one pie is a like perfect single serving huh. um, that you can make at home to recreate your uh, Capital Reef experience. Um, you know, if you are there. Um, during their harvest season, you can even substitute other fruits that you harvest for this pie. You know, so we actually harvested apricots when we were there, but you know, you could turn this instead of berries, you could turn it into an apricot pie if you'd like. Yeah. I've got to ask you here, you've got uh, in the ingredients for the pie filling and you list uh, two cups of raspberries, two cups of blueberries, two cups of blackberries. Is that all for one pie or are those ingredients for three separate pies? Like a raspberry pie, a blueberry pie, a blackberry pie. I believe, I don't have the recipe in front of me, but I believe it's for a few different pies. Okay. Serving size, say. Um, Make six five-inch pies. There you go. There you go. All right. Let's go to the Bourbon Trail in Kentucky, Mammoth Cave National Park. You've got Kentucky bourbon balls, and and I kind of hit on that one because A, I like bourbon, and B, my mother used to make bourbon balls around Christmas time. (laughs) <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. Bourbon balls are um it's kind of like a it's a regional favorite. You know, I remember trying it when I um swung through uh the states and um you know, this is just like a it's a fun recipe. It's not served at Mammoth Cave National Park cuz they don't have their own restaurant, but this is something that you would definitely find on your way in or out of the park. Mm-hmm. Um, my inspiration is from the original um, Kentucky bourbon balls that were made by Rebecca Ruth Candies. Um, or Rebecca Ruth chocolates is what they're known as now. Hmm. And it's a um, very simple confection that you can make. And I offer different variations for the coatings of these bourbon balls, right? So there's a um, melted chocolate with some nuts on top. You can also roll it in powdered sugar or roll it in um, a mix of powdered sugar and cocoa powder. And so uh, depending on what you like, you can even make all three of them, but it's just a, uh, you know, like 
one just pops perfectly into your mouth. <laughs> it really does. And, and it's usually hard to stop at one. Yeah. The one thing I always had trouble with was getting the consistency right for the the ball, as it were. I mean, you've got, um, you know, chopped up pecans and um, some butter and some powdered sugar and the bourbon, of course. And, you know, if you get it too dry, it doesn't hold together well and it would just crumble. And that was really frustrating for me. You had to make sure you got those uh, measurements accurate or at least uh, close enough so you could tweak them a little bit to get the right consistency for rolling those balls. You do. And the way, um, you know, like Rebecca Ruth chocolates, the original balls, like they just have like a creamy filling inside. I add um, toasted and chopped nuts in my pecans just to help them hold together better at home. And also you get like a nice little crunch as you bite into it. We're just going to stick with you a little bit longer because there's so many great recipes here. And I, I don't want to short, short too many of the national parks out there. Obviously, we can't hit all of them. But uh, let's go to Oregon and Cradle Lake National Park where you came away with the Marionberry Galette. Yeah. So um, Marionberries are, I would say, probably a statewide obsession here uh, because you can't really buy them. You can grow them, though. Um, they're very delicate and that's why they're not sold in the stores because they don't, uh, they don't pack well, they don't, um, transport well. And so if you can find them, um, fresh, like that's, that's the best. The galette is my favorite kind of like lazy person's pie is what I call it. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a, a pizza dough. It is. So I, um, I have made my own galette, uh, dough recipe where you can roll it out, but this one. Um, you can use a shortcut by using a pastry sheet and just folding it up over your marionberry filling. And I like to add the um, little ginger pieces, like crystallized ginger pieces, nice. just to give it that extra little zest. Nice. Sounds very nice. Well, before we let you go, Linda, we're really going to put you on the spot. Um, if you're cooking an anniversary dinner for your husband, what items from the cookbook would you put on the menu? From drinks to dessert. Ah, mm. <laughs> it's a tough one. That's a tough one. So let's pretend that I was not bound by what I could find <laughs> in no, my no. sports here, right? Everything, whatever you need. It's just right there on your pantry Yeah, like shelf. what I know he likes to eat. So I would probably start with the blue cheese stuffed dates with prosciutto, wrapped in prosciutto. Mm -hmm. um, and then sprinkled with pomegranates. Um, that's a appetizer that we've had in um, various different places. We also had it in Death Valley National Park, which is where I got inspiration for this recipe. And they're just a really good amuse bouche, right? Because it's uh, just kind of like, what's your palate um, for what else is to come? You know, it's a great, like, I really like in recipes a mix of sweet and savory and even mm -hmm. like tart, you know, like I love like that intriguing blend of flavors in my mouth when I'm chewing and swallowing. And, um, and that's what these prosciutto wrapped dates are like, you know, so um, I recommend starting with that at least for him. Okay. And then I remember when I was doing all of this cooking and he would have to help me eat all of the food. <laughs> <laughs> Darn. <laughs> And one of his favorites was definitely the braised bison short ribs with really? moustule beer. Okay, you know, so this is, yeah. Um, so this is a very special recipe because you're using um, braised bone and short ribs, which are not easy to find. Um, but we actually have some in the freezer still. <laughs> yeah. um, and this is like, you know, like the longer something is cooked, typically it, the better it tastes, you know. So this recipe, I remember like I was making it for hours um, and it was just like filling the house with these crazy smells that were like so savory and like, you know, so buttery and, and we were dying. Cause we're like, God, are they, are they done yet? <laughs> Cause every time we opened the oven door, just to check, it would just like fill the house. Hmm. <laughs> um, so this is definitely one of our favorites. It's like a, it's like a, it's kind of like a labor of love. Okay. Um, right. You know, but the, the short ribs, when they're cooked for that long, they just totally fall off the bone. Super, super tender. Bison, 
I feel like most people have not had it. I would say that um, I don't find them gamey at all. They're just like very rich to me, um, richer than beef, uh, which I really like. And so their juices actually flavor the liquid that they're simmering in for that long. Right. And you use the same liquid um, that you also add moustrule beer or any kind of like your favorite brown ale to. I was going to say, you can't, you can't find moustrule um, probably out of the Rocky Mountain region. Probably not. Occasionally I find it in like, you know, some specialty beer store here uh, because mm. we are a beer town. So I have found it before, but you can use any brown ale. Okay. Um, you know, you can even use Newcastle brown ale, which I think is available everywhere. You know, but the liquid that the short ribs simmer in, you can use that um, to go over like a roasted vegetable side dish or some mashed potatoes or even a baked potato or even rice. It really makes it. Um, yeah. So let's see. What else would he like? Oh, for a drink, um, of course, because I, of course, have to serve a drink. We really enjoyed the Marion Berry Smash when we made it. Um, if you don't have Marion berries, you can substitute blackberries, which will give you a very similar flavor. Um, Marion berry smash is very, uh, I would say it's almost sangria like, but not as sweet as sangria. You know, so it's brandy and red wine together with a little bit of simple syrup um, and like muddled Marion berries or blackberries. Uh, but it just gives this drink a it's a, it's an easy sipper. Yeah. Yeah. I'll definitely have to try that once uh, summer arrives, which may not be till August this year in Utah. We got so much snow this winter. It's been excellent. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> it really is. It really is. Um, I, I don't know if you want to throw any miscellaneous items in there or go right to dessert. Um, yeah, we can go straight to dessert. So let's see. For dessert, hmm, what would I serve him? I would say say that a dessert that I mean I don't know if he would be into it but it's so over the top <laughs> <laughs> that I would probably serve it because it's also really fun to make is, okay. is the sky high Shenandoah pie <laughs> oh really is that like a uh, a mud pie um similar it's so it's a um I made it in a pre-made uh pie crust and then you fill it with a ton of ice cream and then you make a really nice um, meringue on top and then you blow torch over it. But it's called a sky high pie because it's it's big. Yeah. <laughs> it's very high. Um, and and the whole pie is just ice cream. <laughs> it, it looks wonderful. And, and for this, they use blackberry ice cream, but I guess your, your favorite ice cream could work. Yes, you can use any ice cream. So you can even use like Marion Berry ice cream if you want to keep up the Marion Berry theme with your smash cocktail. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but there yes, you, you can go. use any ice cream with it. And, you know, the fun part is really making that meringue on top and trying to whip it and make it as, you know, tall as you can. <laughs> um, it, it makes for a really great presentation on the plate. Very nice. Very nice. Well, Linda, thanks so much for joining us today. This is a great cookbook. I'm going to have a lot of fun with it. Um, hopefully my wife will like it. Um, but you got some excellent recipes in here, and they don't look too, uh, too challenging for this home chef, at least. Um, I'll let you know how they come out. Perfect. Thank you, Kurt. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm sure we will. That was Linda Lee, the author of a new cookbook that you need in your home kitchen library, uh, the National Park Cookbook. that's our show for this week. I hope you enjoyed it and it sparked some creativity for your mealtime endeavors. The book's title is really straightforward. The National Parks Cookbook by Linda Lee. And Lee is spelled L-Y. Next week, to kick off National Parks Week, I'll be joined by National Park Foundation CEO Will Shafroff to discuss the various work the foundation is making possible across the national park system. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. 
Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.